Most of the time, I'd say actually the overwhelming amount of time that I meet people and they learn what I do, uh, you can guess that they don't think that I'm a pastor. <laughs> but anyway, and this isn't just here in the city, but it's everywhere. I'm always losing my earrings, but it's everywhere. They say some version of this. Hmm. I like Jesus. I like Jesus. I might, maybe they'll even say I love Jesus. But I'm not so sure about his friends. Have you ever heard somebody say that before? I like Jesus. I love Jesus, but I'm not so sure about his friends. And after they get over their whole shock that, I, that they have that I'm a pastor, which, to be honest, I've gotten so used to now, I've kind of turned it into a little bit of a joke and a game. You've got to make, make fun when it, instead of getting insulted, right? But anyway, but, um, you know, I just want to say this. A lot of times when people elevate clergy, it's because they're accustomed to clergy wanting to be worshipped themselves. And I don't want to be worshipped. I think that sounds awful. And, um, but a lot of the better known clergy in the world do. And we can get into some fascinating conversations if we just bring things down to people's levels. And this is what I, I know. Here I am standing here, but you won't see me if I stand down there. So it's not because I think I'm elevated. But I don't elevate myself because I actually happen to know myself. And I don't want to be worshipped because I want us all to be worshipping Jesus. But my job is to lead you from away from idolatry, not to draw you into some sort of cult of kaji. But cults are pro actually popular, and it's an easier way to get people to be consistent, because you remember how this church was exactly full with all the chairs up last week for Easter? And of course, that happens for Resurrection Sunday. Um, in a church where you, if, it, if this were cult of Kaji, you'd be scared not to be here this week and you'd be here again. So you can fill the pews that way, but it's not necessarily honoring people's where they are. And this is why people say, I like Jesus, but not so much his friends. But here we are in a world of folks who think that what's required to be a friend of Jesus is to be part of some sort of cult of following. Now, I happen to like Jesus, but I don't really like his friends, they'll say. And this got me thinking. Give me a moment here. What exactly does it mean to be Jesus' friend in a contemporary context, like right now? What do you think it means? What have you been told that it means? I know what you've seen. I have an idea what you've witnessed, but homest among us in the room or amongst the people you know do you think Jesus would call a friend? As you can imagine, I do have an answer for this, and that's what today we'll, we'll talk about. And we all can deepen in our biblical literacy and scour the Gospels, and we can look and see whom Jesus called friend. And if you don't know the story well, you might be surprised at the answer, at the Bible's answer. Jesus was friends with exactly the people who you'd least expect him to spend time with. Pretty much all of Jesus's closest friends were homeless. They were itinerant, moving around town to town, wandering. And from what I can tell, pretty much depending on the kindness of strangers and new friends that they would make as they went along the way. There were no Bentleys involved. Beyond this, they were the hated, the outcasts, the so-called untouchables. And this isn't to say that they were the only people who followed Jesus. The Jesus movement included all kinds, including the very rich. But I would say that his inner circle was different. And those were the people you could easily identify as his, as his friends because they were the ones he spent time with, but much like the rest of us. The Gospels to demonstrate that Jesus had different circles of friends. When it came down to it, what I really want you to understand is that Jesus was an excellent judge of character and saw right through to the heart of a person. That was true then, and I would say it's still true now, and that's actually good news. Deep in your heart, Jesus knows all the good that God has implanted there which is why I am confident 
that he would call you friend. Absolutely, yes, you, yes, you, yes, you, yes, all of you. And if you doubt this, especially you. Hmm, so doubt, that's a, that's a difficult one. In my pastoral care, so many of you can tell me your deepest and darkest secrets. Pretty much, you know, we can have that conversation one-on-one -on -one and that works, right? And you can do it even with a straight face. But the point, and this is just, I've just started to realize this, but the point at which most people begin to really lose it is when they start to tell me about their doubts. And the reason for that is that there's this shame that accompanies their doubts. And they tend to go hand in hand, doubt and shame, especially for people who want to be Jesus's friends. So maybe this will help. Know this, you do not need to earn Jesus's friendship. He gives it freely. In fact, it's so precious and valuable that you couldn't ever put a price on it. Even if you could earn it, nobody could because it's that valuable. But Jesus's grace runs free. And as I started mentioning last week, these things that bother us, God's not bothered. And I'm not saying that Jesus likes our sins. It's clearer that he doesn't. But his friendships are still with sinners because everybody does it. His friendships are with the sinners, and they're not against them. And he couldn't care less about your doubts, except for what those doubts do to you. Something else you learn from the Gospels is just how busy Jesus was. He was always in demand. And I don't know who kept his calendar. Someone obviously did, because you can see those dynamics amongst the disciples. But you can tell from the way his friends handled him that they were always trying to get him on to the next thing, like they knew people were waiting. And Jesus was so busy, he actually did have to prioritize. You see this, right? Much like everybody else. But after he appeared to Mary Magdalene and to the women, after he was raised from the dead, do you know how Jesus prioritized his time? I want you to pay attention to this. He showed up for his friends. And even though he told them, even though he had already told them what he was going to do, and then he did what he said that he would, his people still didn't know what to make of all this resurrection business. Was it rumor? Was it fantasy? Was it too good to be true? They asked these natural questions that you know you'd ask too. I know I would. The whole line of thinking amongst Jesus's friends is epitomized in the story of Thomas. Jesus's friends these days call him Doubting Thomas, which I think is a bit reductive. But for the pur purposes of today, I do want you to understand that Thomas really did doubt. And I'm confident that he wasn't alone in his doubts. He just happened to be willing to say out loud what some of the other friends probably felt too ashamed to say. So Jesus shows up to where his friends were hiding. The door was locked. He comes through it anyway, right? And then they welcome him. And here he does something very, very important, because that miracle of walking through a door, that might have been enough for Thomas. But Jesus remembered and had already heard what Thomas had said, almost those doubts that he articulated when he wasn't even there. He answered them as if, as, as God answers a prayer. So he gets through the door. They see him. They're like, wow, that's Jesus. And then he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. It's like a Pentecost moment. Always the planner. Jesus knows that they're going to need that gift of the Holy Spirit so that no matter where they went, God would be with them. He soon would be ascending to the heavens, but the Holy Spirit would endure and remain with them as it does to this very day. Take a deep breath. You just breathed in the Holy Spirit. But Jesus' friends didn't know that. They, they didn't know that just yet. They just took the breath 
Anyway, all of this happens, this incredible world-changing gift of giving the Holy Spirit is given, but Thomas, eh, he's still not so sure. And he says this much, how dare he? How could he? If he had enough faith, he would just follow the rest of them, right? Like a cult. He'd fall on his knees and he'd worship and he'd give thanks and praise and all the holy things, right? So he questions Jesus and he articulates his doubt. And then Jesus turns on him and breathes fire down his throat and banishes him from his presence, right? No. That's what you think would happen. And if you happen to feel any guilt for your doubts, then that's especially what you would expect from God. That's not how it goes, though. Even if you don't think that consciously, that's what one would expect from the story, from the way that I hear your doubts and your shame from it from you. But if you think this way, if you feel shame for your doubts, I need you to understand something. It's just not right, it's not biblical, it doesn't comport with what the Gospels teach us. There need be no shame. When Thomas expressed his doubt and showed the pain that informed that doubt, remember he's grieving, Jesus didn't breathe fire on him. He gave him no smoke. Instead, do you know what he did? He met him. He met him, he met the doubter right where he was. And he gave that doubter everything that the doubter needed to come square to the truth of his resurrection and the gifts of the miracle that he was witnessing. And you could argue, and I do, that the doubter actually had to articulate those doubts, to speak them aloud, in order for Jesus to respond most efficiently. This all met God's purposes and plans is what I'm saying. And what I mean by this is there's no shame and doubt, and Jesus just didn't ask for it. So drop the shame. Spiritual shame is unhelpful. In shame's place, because shame comes and is accompanied by your pain, hand that over to God. And God is going to give you what you need to witness the miracles already present in your life. I promise this because Jesus did it and Jesus continues to do it and it's who the Holy Spirit is. And I know it because Jesus did it for his friends in the Bible and does it for us now too. Busy Jesus prioritized meeting his friends where they were. He didn't make them come to him. He showed up for his friends where they were physically. Now too with the Holy Spirit, Jesus meets them. In a recent conversation with someone who loves Jesus but not so much his friends, a young woman, let's call her Jay, that's not her name, but we'll call her that, had made her way to the U.S. from Southern Africa. And now she's working as a traveling nurse, offering her gifts, very much uh, conscious that she's offering them as a ministry and a calling, but she's not so sure about church. She's scared to go to church because church had hurt way too many people she knew. And clear hypocrites were in church and in charge of church. And she said something to me when she was telling me, I wasn't, you know, I always invite everybody I meet to church and they always give me a reason they can't come. And it, this is the reason she gave me. And I had to write it down. I need church to meet me, not beat me. Meet me, not beat me. And that's my sermon title for today. That's another component of the template for your life in Christ, beloved. No matter what you think of yourself, Jesus calls you friend. No matter what church has told you, Jesus calls you friend. No matter what your cares or your worries or your doubts might be, Jesus calls you friend. No matter the circumstance, God's going to meet you. God will never beat you. If someone's beating you, that's not God. But if you find yourself in the wrath of a bully, because that's what they are, you're right. They're not your friend. They don't want to be Jesus' friend either. 
Redemption is possible for them, but that's not your portion. You aren't God. Your project is to look for the ways that God is meeting you right now in the loving face of someone who calls Jesus friend and loves you because of that. Your job is to find those people. There are lots of them here right now. Because when the storms come, you're going to need those people. You need community. We're not meant to do this alone. And so my invitation to you as I close is that we all have some Christ-like discipline as we build our friendships and community. Don't let these things be an accident. Choose your friends wisely. Meet them as God is meeting you and you will receive the open and loving arms of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this element of worship. We are so grateful that you have entrusted the park with this moment to hear music, to listen to the word of God, whatever it may be. And we just ask for your support. The park only functions with the generous donations of people like you. And 100% of your donation goes to the incredible ministries of this church, which give and give and give again. Thank you for the ways that you give in advance and for all that you might be ready to give in the future. God bless you and amen.